So, good evening, guys. Welcome to day three of your Python bootcamp. It's two more days, and then you'll never have to see me again. Uh, yesterday, we discussed some topics in Oops with Python, and we went into some more depths of Python where we discussed lists, dictionaries, tuples, etc. So, let's just quickly go over that. Um, this is what we did yesterday. We did, we, I gave you an example for chatbot and stuff. And then I explained classes and how we can access members of a class by creating an object for the class outside of the class. Then we can do hi dot member name, like object name dot member name. We can access them easily. We can also alternate them. As you can see here, I've added two different members. This is how class works. We saw how to initialize a class, which means we can actually cause a constructor to come up. And we can initialize a variable for the class. Here you can see the variable num has been initialized for the class square. And it basically returns the square of any number that is given with it. Then there are some more examples of the constructor concept. That is it. Then we see inheritance. We saw that there were several types of inheritance. There was multi-level, multiple, single, hybrid inheritance. And we saw a few examples of it. We saw single level inheritance, multiple inheritance, multi-level inheritance. And then we went through polymorphism. What polymorphism is, is basically one part of code is being used in different ways in different areas. So you see the method area over here. It is being used in one different way in the circle class and another different way in the square class. In the square class, it is basically returning the side times side. All right, and in the circle class it is returning pi r square. But it is the same method, just being used differently. I hope there were no doubts from yesterday's session. Let me just, yeah. Uh, Lohita, you've got your hand raised. Do you have doubt? Okay. Never mind. Good glitch. Yeah. Does anyone have any doubts from yesterday's session? There's no doubts you can say so from your end, that is. Guys, I'd rather not speak to myself. Uh, someone just give me some feedback, please. No doubts. No doubts. OK, thank you. Uh, one more thing is, uh, is there anyone who has completed the project that was given yesterday, the assignment that is? Just raise your hand, please. Uh, do you mean the chatbot thing or the exercise one? Yeah, no, the chatbot thing. I have not shared the exercise yet. The exercise will be shared today. So that is just for revision. I'm going to go through the exercises and the answers for tomorrow. OK, so Shaurya has finished his chatbot. Is there anyone else who has finished their chatbots? And I assume, Shaurya, that you've uploaded on your GitHub profile as well? Uh, no, I have to upload it now. OK, OK, uh, so the thing is the Google form will be shared with you guys shortly, either tonight or tomorrow, like by the first half of tomorrow, that is. So if you're done with your codes, all you can do, all you have to do is just push it down to your GitHubs. Uh, Quite an easy so, process. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have to create a repository and then. Uh, yeah, yes, you need to create a repository, just name it whatever and save the file as bootcamp underscore your registration number or chatbot underscore your registration number, whatever. Put your registration number after whatever the title of the file is, so it is understood and is easier for us to access, okay? I hope this is clear to everyone. Yes. Yes, bro. Uh, yes. Okay. yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I hope yesterday's concepts of oops is also clear to everyone. Do I have to go over it again for anyone? If so, you can just raise your hand. I'll quickly glance through it again. Uh, Shilpa, okay. Would you, okay, a few people. Um, would you guys uh, like me to re like redo the concepts? Like just quickly go through them and I can finish it in 15 minutes. Yes, yes, bro. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Um, so this is a class, a class. You simply write the word class, and then you name it whatever you'd like to. And then you put a colon. Oh, whoops. 
and after the colon, whatever your code comes within this tabbed area over here, these are all going to be members of your class or objects of your class. Okay. Everything you do inside this will be a part of hello. If I say print, sorry. Uh, Jashmika, your mic. You wouldn't mind reading it unless you have a doubt. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is very simple. You just created a class and it has several members. Now, outside of the class, how you can access these members is by creating an object of this. And then you can, you know, simply access them however you'd like to through the object. Hi.b is basically hello's member B over here equals three. So high dot B will be three and you can see three is printed over here. Again, high dot A will be A equals two. So this will be two. So this will print two. And you can see that over here. High dot C is a value given zero and three plus two is five. So I've added high dot A and high dot B and you've seen the output here to be five. Okay. I hope this is clear. Then constructors. Um, what a constructor is, is basically you're setting your class up for some value to be assigned to it as an object. Later on, whenever you create an object of this class, this is what class square you've done. Define initialize. Remember this uh, syntax very clearly, please. Self comma variable name. Now this variable name can be whatever you can just call it var. Okay. And self dot var equals var. Then print var star star two. What this does is this is some variable that you're assigning to this class. You're initializing it so that whenever you create an object of this class square, this variable will be assigned the value that you put over here. Okay. So this is a constructor. And since the return statement here is print var star star two, so it will give you the square of whatever number you put in the argument. I've put the number eight. I got the square of eight, which is 64. If I put 11, oops, second, I will get 121. And the square of 11 is 121, unless you skipped basic math. Um, this is an example of the constructor concept. Okay. Now this is a detailed example of the constructor concept. You see the class man over here has limbs as yes, trunk as no, gender as M, and then you've created a simple constructor to initialize the name of a man. You see woman over here, limbs yes, trunk no, gender is F, and you've initialized the name again. Similarly, Class is elephant, limbs yes, trunk is true. You can also create this to be yes, and that you have another constructor in a, over here, with the name. Then you've created a few objects. Deepa is equal to woman of Deepa. Dipto is equal to man of Dipto. What this argument here is basically the name. You see the constructors over here? You're assigning a name to this character. Then Rahi equals woman of Rahi, Dumbo equals elephant of Dumbo. And then you can simply access the variables over here. And what this underscore underscore class underscore underscore is, is the class of whatever variable name you put before it. So if I put Dipto, I'll get the class of Dipto. What class does Dipto belong to? Anyone? If you look at the code over here. What class does Dipto belong to? Man. Oh, and what class does Rahi belong to? So, so whatever the class the object belongs to, that is what will be generated. And the dot trunk dot limbs, what you see here are members of these class. So you can access the members of these class, these classes, sorry, using this code snippet. Is this understood by everyone? Any doubt here so far? No, bro. Okay, thank you.
Now I'll quickly go through inheritance. Inheritance is basically your father's property is going to you. Now, alternatively, your father's property can go to you and your brother. In another way, your father and your mother's property will come to you. Or your father and your mother's property will come to you and you will give it to your son and your daughter. That is all inheritances. You have a parent class. Parent class has a few members. And from these members, you're taking all of the, uh, you know, you're inheriting all of these properties and you're giving them to a child class. So this is a simple example of inheritance. Let's go through single level inheritance first. You have a class animal. Now you have a method here, def make sound and you're passing it. That's all. This, you're just saying, ki, okay, fine. This animal is making a sound. Now you have dog of animal. Whenever you create a class and in parenthesis, there is another class name over here. It means that this class will inherit all the properties of this class. Okay. So you have dog of animal here and you have def make sound of self, which is another method and you're returning woof. Then you have cat of animal. This is not, this is multi level inheritance actually. Single level inheritance would be cat of dog, which means animal inherits everything that, sorry, dog inherits everything that animal has to offer and cat inherits everything that dog has to offer. I think I changed this example yesterday, but over here it was bulldog. Okay. And you have to create two, uh, obviously objects over here, and then you can access all of the methods as they have been printed. Is this understood? Wait one second. I have a PPT somewhere. Ignore my very beautiful wallpaper. Python. Give it a second. There we go. This is a simple diagram to explain inheritance to you, Peter. Single inheritance, one parent one child. Multi-level inheritance, you have one parent that has a child and this child has another child. Multiple inheritance, you have multiple parents and one child. Hierarchical inheritance, you have one parent and two or more children. And hybrid inheritance is the mixture of everything. All of these kinds of inheritances, you can see them together in the hybrid inheritance mode. Okay. That is all you have to know about inheritance. You don't need to understand it better for now. Uh, I assume most of you people are freshers. So the concepts of inheritance and everything will be explained to you better in when you're learning Java. Okay, and you guys will be learning Java soon. Um, let us continue with polymorphism. Polymorphism is basically you have one method and you're using it in different ways. Um, sorry, does anyone have any doubts so far? Yeah, nice. Uh, no. Okay, thank you. There we go. Um, so you have polymorphism over here, wherein you have a method and you're using this method in multiple ways. So you have def area over here and you're using it in circle to give you pi r square, but you're using it class using this method in class square to give you the square of the side. That's all you're doing. Okay. So very simple explanation for polymorphism using one object in many ways. And you can see the output over here, circle of five square of four, and you get the responses as they are. Area equal to 78.5, 16. This is pi r square for five. This is four square. There we go. I assume there are no more doubts over here. So if there is, please just feel free to speak up, okay? All right, thank you. 
um let us start with today's topic this is an exercise that i'm going to be giving to you people um just a quick glance that is we'll close this let us start with numpy now uh, if you remember in the first lecture, I had explained that um, there are multiple modules in Python which are built in. Like uh, you can say the module date time, which gives you the date or the time, and whatever. You can see the module OS. These are just some examples of modules that are already in Python when you install them. There are some other modules which allow the functionality of Python. What Python is already, let me just enable the camera. Yeah, what Python is it's for itself. You can use it for a lot more. Okay, give this lag or something. The lag on my screen. So, yeah. So what you use Python for, you can use it for a lot more using these external functions, uh, external modules is what I'm saying. NumPy is one of those modules. And what is NumPy? It literally it's number Python. That's how it was named. It's that simple. Now, what is it? It is a linear algebra library for Python. The reason it is so important for data science with Python is that almost all of the libraries in the PyData ecosystem rely on NumPy as one of their main building blocks, which means NumPy will be a prerequisite for most of your data analysis or machine learning related modules in Python. OK. So this is NumPy. It is also incredibly fast. It has bindings to C libraries. How it has bindings to C libraries, it's an inf inside information. You can go through its official documentation. If you'd like to understand more about NumPy, I'll share this link with you, obviously. How we install it is by saying pip install NumPy into your command line. Okay. Now, if you're using Anaconda, you do conda install NumPy. Oh, it's written down over here. You say conda install numpy and then you wait for a few minutes and if your internet is bad a few hours and then you're done okay now using numpy how you use numpy is basically uh, you'd seen in a previous uh, in, uh, like example how i had imported a module how you import a module is by just typing import and the name of the module now, of course, I can import module as whatever name I'd like to call. I can call it this, but then wherever I want to use my module once imported, I need to use that name constantly. If I do ABC, I always have to use ABC dot this, ABC dot that, ABC of this, and so on. Okay. Therefore, NP is the most generic name because NP, obviously. Okay. Uh, let's go through the PPT that I've made. Close this, don't save. There we go. Getting started with NumPy. Yes. Um, what is NumPy? It is a linear algebra library. It's the same thing. Yes. These are the official documentations and how you can install NumPy. Uh, this is how to install NumPy and arrays in NumPy. Arrays are one of the main methods of using NumPy extensively. NumPy arrays are usually offered in two ways, vectors and matrices. Now, can anyone tell me what a matrix is? Anyone just, it's a very simple definition. Arrangement of like elements in the form of rows and columns. Okay, that is a very good explanation. Thank you. Uh, yes, management of and uh, of elements in rows and columns. So yes, you can create one directional, which means just one dimensional arrays, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in one row itself. Or you can organize it in rows and columns. You can see this example over here, how you've created an array of multiple variables and displayed them as a matrix. OK. Now arrays in NumPy, some other inbuilt methods of generating. Let's look at the code first. OK. Here you have arrays allow duplicates. 
This is something very important to remember. If I do one, two, three, four, it is going to give me one, two, three, four. But if I do one, two, three, three, give me one, two, three, three. It does not care about what the value is. It will only care about which index location it is stored in. OK. Now again, we have a equals un np of np dot array of list one. So you've created an array of list one. And you've stored it to a. Then you want to append some values to list one. Let's just look at the. This thing first, do you see the one difference between this and this? Can you point it out? Just the outputs. Can anyone point out the difference in the outputs? Very simple. This they are not, they are not separated by commas. Yes, that is it. So very simple explanation. Why they are not separated by commas is because NumPy says that arrays are a completely different data set. So they are going to always display all elements separated by spaces, not commas. There is no need for commas because it is not a list. It is not a whatever data type you've put in over here. It is an array. So to separate arrays and lists, there are no commas over here. Okay. Again, you've created a matrix. Over here you can see it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you see that the matrix is displayed over here like this. Because this is still a list. No. This matrix is not a matrix, it is a list. But as soon as you run it through numpy.array, it gets converted into a matrix. Okay, now if I add one more over here, 13, 14, 15, close it, and then I run this, you see how it increases itself. Also, note one thing, numpy.array always likes to be symmetric when it is printing its mat matrices. If I remove these two, you see how it becomes smaller? Then I do this and then I create another one, 100, 100, 104. You see how it becomes bigger? NumPy.array always likes to satisfy your OCD. It is always going to be even. OK, I hope this much is understood. It's a very simple thing. You're taking a list and you're converting it into an array. And a matrix. Oops, yeah. Feel free to interrupt me if there's any doubts anywhere, OK? There are some built in methods to generate arrays. There's a range which returns evenly spaced values within a given interval. Simple enough to understand. You have a small a starting value, you have an ending value. And it gives you all the values between this range. Except the last number, OK? So beginning value to last value minus one is what it will give you. If you do this, it will give you 10. If you do this, do this, no, not 120, I don't want so many. It'll give you till 19 and so on, okay? So I'm gonna do 10 over here, so now, there we go. This is a range, which means, you remember range from before? This is just array range and it prints it as an array, okay? Again, np dot a range 0 11 2. Now what this 2 is, is it gives you evenly spaced values. You can see it over here. Which means it will skip 2 and then give you the next one. So if you want a simpler way to print odd numbers from 1 to 19, for example, you will do 1, 20 and 2. And you see 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. They are all odd numbers and they are all between 1 and 20. Okay. This is a very simple explanation. I hope this is understood. Any doubts so far? Um, anyone? Uh, yes. Money Deepak. Give it out. All right, okay. Um, zeros and ones generates arrays of zeros and ones. Basically, generates an array or a matrix with only zeros or only ones, as you specified, filled in it. 
if I do NP dot zeros uh, three, it gives me an array of three zeros. If I do 20, it gives me an array of 20 zeros. If I do 50, give me 50 zeros. Again, five times five. This generates a five by five matrix. If I do five by six, it will give me a five by six matrix. I do seven by five, give me a seven by five matrix. If I do something like 10 comma 10, there we go. We have a very big matrix filled with zeros. Now, similarly, I do the same thing with ones. Boom, they're all ones. There's obviously no way to do zeros and ones together. But if you want to generate a matrix filled with only zeros or only ones, this is the way to go. Okay, easy enough to understand. Length space returns evenly spaced numbers over a specified interval. Now you remember a range, it gives you values between a given interval from zero to 20. You have values which are skipping two numbers each. So one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15. Lin space does not care about how long the distance is. It will give you the value in them exactly. So you see from zero to 10, if I want 50 spaces, it has 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8, 2, 2.4, 2, 2 2.6, 2 2.8, so on and so forth until it reaches 10. 50 exactly spaced values until it reaches the target value. Now, if I do five, two, it has the starting value and the ending value. But if I do three, can anyone tell me the output of this? Anyone? Zero, two point five, five. Perfect. There you go. Zero, two point five, and five. That is your answer. If I do four, it will give you this. So one by three, two by three, and five. If I do five, give me 1.25, 2.5, 3.75, 5, and so on and so forth. You can take to seven, oops. You can change it to 20 if you'd like. And it gives you equally spaced values between everything. Look at this. This is what lin space does. I hope this is understood between, for, for, for everyone. Okay, I'm just gonna chat and there we go. Okay. Um, I creates an identity matrix. Now, identity matrices are also known as unit matrices, or uh, yeah, I don't remember any other names, but yeah, they're also known as unit matrices. And what they are is a matrix filled with zeros, but all of the diagonals are ones. So if I do, oops, P dot zeros, what? Oh, spelling error, my bad. Uh, so over here, you see all of these diagonals, they'll just be replaced by ones. If I do I, what happened? Tuple object cannot be interpreted as an, Ah, I see. Maybe this will fix it. There we go. So you see all the diagonal values have become ones. This is what I does. It creates an identity matrix of whatever order you give it. One thing is any identity matrix needs to be equally primed. So if I do four comma four, it will accept it. But if I do four comma five, you see this extra column over here? This is only filled with zeros because it does not understand. I do 4.6. You have two columns now filled with zeros and the diagonal still runs over here. 8.6. You see there are two rows over here which are filled with zeros. And the diagonals have nothing over here. Oh, so sad. Anyhow, this is I. Um, any doubts? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
the, okay okay now we have random now numpy has a lot of ways of creating random number arrays like rand or rand is is it gives you array of the given shape and populate it with random samples from a uniform distribution over 0 comma 1 now you remember linspace linspace will give you equally balanced values between these two numbers rand is the same thing but it will give you random values between only 0 comma 1 so let's just say you see now 25 randomly va placed values sorry 10, 25 uniformly placed values have been placed from 0 to 1 but over here in rand you will find random values placed regardless of they, they'll be completely unbiased so if you're trying to play a game of chance you know trying to hit a number closest to one uh, like four or five rand is your way to go you do you always do np dot random dot rand you cannot do rand directly because that will throw you an error this is not a method of numpy it is a method of numpy dot random now you can see the values and always the values will keep changing see how it's never the same value that is it again when you're trying to print them in matrix form as well let's say eight times five every time the value is different and you saw e as well so they are trying to print the sorry the code is trying to print random values which are so small that sometimes it has to generate in 10 to the power minus ones as well okay that is all there is to it any doubts over here okay i assume not um similar to rand you have rand n which gives you a standard normal distribution unlike rand which is uniform this is of completely random uniform uh, completely random distribution it does not care about the bounds it does not care about 0 comma 1 what is 0 comma 1 it does not care it will give you all values from minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and it will keep changing never be the same and these will always be values from minus 2 to 2 sometimes you'll get more values as well higher values as well they'll be completely random all the time okay Similarly, you have rand int. Return random integers from low to high. Return random dot rand int of one comma hundred. Gives you a random integer from one to hundred. So if you want to do guess the number while a game, you can do it some using this. You just assign it a variable, and then you do p equals input of enter a number and if a equal to equal to b oops print you win else oops print boo hoo five boo hoo obviously you will never know unless uh you know what the answer was print sorry the answer was comma a. The answer was 23. See, you can create random games like this using something like randint. And if this is understood, this is a very easy code. All right. You can also create a heads and tails game. Okay. Like instead of 1, 100, you do 1, 2. And for one, you assign heads, and for two, you assign tails. If A equals one, print heads. If B equals two, sorry, if A equals two, print tails. It's very simple. The possibilities are endless. You just have to think about it really hard. Okay. NP random dot random one comma hundred comma ten. This gives you ten random numbers from the given range. By two. Four random numbers from one to five hundred. There we go. Four random numbers from one to five hundred. This these could be any number. You have a two-digit number here as well. 
Okay, very easy to understand. I'm assuming all of you understood this. This also, guys, NumPy is extremely important for any machine learning module that you might learn in the future, because for data analysis, NumPy is the way to go. That is all I will say. Okay, pay attention to this. The notes will be uploaded later. Go through them later as well. Um, some array attributes and methods. ARR equals NP dot A range 25. Can anyone tell me what this is? What does this give you? Oops. Yeah. Any idea what NP dot A range of 25 will give you? We just discussed this. Guys, I'd really not talk to a stone wall over here, please. An array of numbers from 0 to 25? Yes, you are right. It gives you an array of numbers from 0 to 24. So always remember, whatever the number is given here, don't be fooled by it. It's always one number less than it. If you really want from 0 to 25, you just do this. And boom. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. For the sake of the code to continue running, I'm going to put 25 over here. And ran AR is just another random array, which is np.random.randent. If you saw over here, from 0 to 50, 10. So 10 random numbers from 0 to 50. You run this again, and it's 10 random numbers. Okay. These are some simple array attributes. Now you're going to see reshape. What is reshape? Returns an array containing the same data, the new shape. Array dot reshape five comma five. Now ARR is an of uh, is zero to twenty four all values, right? All it does is reshape it, but there is no other way to reshape it than the way it has already been placed. If I do run ARR dot reshape. You see, wait, cannot reshape array of size 10 into shape 5 by 5. Okay, let me do 2 by 5. There we go. Now, this is just whatever the array is, it has been reshaped into matrix. Okay. Max, min, arg, max, arg, min. Now, arg, max, and arg, min are basically argumentative maximum and minimum. These are useful methods for finding max or min values or to find their index locations using argmax or argmin. Again, what argmin is, does is it finds where your smallest value is. It gives you its index location. I hope everyone remembers what an index location is. Can anyone tell me what the index location of 15 in this array will be? Three. Perfect. Sorry, sorry. Why? Okay, there are 215. Okay. Zero, one, two, three. Yes, uh, there are 215s. You're right. That is a little bit confusing. Uh, one second. Let me just. Hey. One, two, three. Boom. Now, can anyone tell me what is the index value of, um, say, 46? Four. 46, 46. Oh, this 46. Seven. There is another 46. Yeah. yeah seven. seven. Yes, you would be right. Man, I hate random integers. How are there two random integers twice? Okay, fair enough. Um, okay. Now you have ran ARR. Let's just run this again. Now, what is the maximum value in this array? 46. Okay. Now, if you were to find the argumentative maximum, which is basically the index location. Which one do you think would be printed? This or this? The first one. first one. You are right. No matter how many times I run it, it will always print the first one because whenever you look at an array, it will start from left to right. Wherever it finds the first highest value, no matter if it doesn't matter if it finds a same value again, it'll print the first one. Yeah. Min again will be 12 and argumentative min. Where is it? Right over here. So five, I guess. There we go. 
shape. Uh, I this is a very simple topic. I'm not going to explain it again. There we go. Shape is an attribute that arrays have. It is not a method. It is just a shape. It shows you the shape of whatever thing you have. OK, so if you have an array with 25 values in it, it just shows you the shape. It has 25 values as rows and zero values as columns because it is not a matrix, is it? Okay. Um, let's just do this and ARR dot reshape of one comma twenty-five. Now you've created two sets of brackets you can see over here because you've reshaped this, so you've created an array of the array. Now if I do Five comma five, and I assign this to a value a equals the other of free shape and a, and then I look for a dot shape. Oops, that's the next code. Sorry, you see a dot shape will give you five comma five. Why? Because I've reshaped it into a five times five matrix. We'll just return the same shape, right? If I were to do uh, four times six, oh wait, I can't do that. I need to make it within bounds. Whatever, you can experiment with this later on. Okay. So, ARR dot reshape twenty five comma one. You are just putting twenty five values for twenty five rows and putting them into one singular column. If you do two columns, size into twenty five. Oh, whoops. 10, 2, no, nah, you can't do that. 12.5, 2, you can't divide a value into 2 either. Um, what else is divisible by 25? Wow, it does not have any prime factors. So this is the only thing you can do. Okay. But if the size of the matrix is different, if it was like 64, you would be able to do it with 4, you would be able to do it with 2, with 8, with 16, and so on. Okay. You can just reshape however you would want it. And you can see the shape as well. And D type. D type simply tells you the data type of whatever the array has. Okay. If I were to do ran error dot D type, that gives you in 32 as well. So 32 byte integers. That is what this means. Any doubts over here? No, it's clear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Any doubts at all? All right, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Let's close this. Wait, actually, no, you know what? I'll keep this for reference. Indexing and selection. Now, indexing, can, can anyone tell me what indexing means? What is indexing? In an array or a list, what is indexing? Maybe referring to a certain element using a particular, using its position or index. OK, you are correct. Uh, over here, you see the arg max and arg min. What are these doing? They are literally finding the maximum value and they are returning the index of that value where it is in the list or array. Sorry. So indexing literally refers to finding the position of an element. Selection is basically selection. So you import numpy as np as usual. Create a sample array, a range 1, comma 11, which is 10 numbers. Now, ARR of 8 will give you 9. Why? Because indexing always starts with 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, ARR of 8 will give you the value 9. And I discussed this yesterday. Colon refers to printing every value before this and the value itself. Okay. So if I were to do this, it will give me every value before 5 and 5 itself. 8, every value before 8 and 8 itself. And if I do 6 colon, again, that will give me every value after 6, but I will exclude 6. One place it will be included, one place it will be excluded. Simple as that. If I were to do 3, it gives me 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Simple. Get values in a range, you can do that using the colon again. One to five. It excludes the one, gives you everything after one. So two, three, four, and five. 
oops, if I do nine and four, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine. Any idea what I'll get if I do six and ten? Seven to ten. Yes, you were right. Your values in a range. Okay, this is another example. Same thing. How can I add to an array? For you, I can use the np dot append function. So what I do is I create another array or ARR2 and I do np dot append first array, comma, second array. Now instead of these values, no, I don't want to put values. They don't they don't look as aesthetic. If you want to do something like that, you create an array. np dot array of um let's say 11 12 13 okay and a you see it gives you the same response if you don't want to put the list over here the array over here you can simply make another array and then you can append these two now arr3 equals np dot array of this arr4 equals np of array of this you can concatenate. What concatenating means is basically you're putting them together. Now, can you tell me one odd thing that you find about this part over here? Something is different. Tell me what is this? It's in two different parentheses. Yes, you are correct. Why is it in two different parentheses? Can anyone take a guess? Any wild guess? Because we have taken two arrays, different arrays. No, OK. Um, this is something I wouldn't particularly expect someone to guess, actually. But yeah, uh, nice try. This is because the concatenate function does not just have one parameter. It has two parameters. Other than the number of arrays, if I were to create another array, ARR, phi equals np dot array of um 35 40 45 okay comma arr 5 you see it has concatenated this but there is another argument over here comma axis now what axis does is you remember in geometry you can rotate stuff over the x axis y axis z axis similarly in numpy using arrays you can display or concatenate over a certain axis if it is more than one dimensional so right now i have only one dimensional arrays over here you will see multi dimensional arrays later when i discuss matplotlib matplotlib sorry but over here if i do 0 it concatenates over the axis 0 if i do 1 it will say Axis one is out of bounds for array of dimension one because this is a one dimension. Uh, it is a singular dimensional thing. No? So it starts at zero. Anything more than that would be not accepted. Even if I do minus one, minus one will be accepted. But if I try doing minus two, sorry, it is again out of bounds. Okay, it's just to zero, and I hope this understands. Broadcasting. Suppose you have your own TV show and you want to show it to multiple channels. Star Plus, Star Movies, Star Sports, Star Film, Star This, Star That. You have to broadcast it to all of those different television channels. Okay. Similarly, using NumPy, you can broadcast one value to a range of values. If I want, these all values ARR2, all of these values will become 68. Very dangerous number I chose. Um, broadcasting again, you see this. ARR, okay, let us first do print ARR. And you see it is a array from 1 to 10. Okay. Then ARR from 0 to 5 equals 100. 
you see one, two, three, four, five have become hundred. Five to six, one to six will become hundred. And why did this affect the first part of the code? Because this updated code was the one that was already running. So it was already changed to hundred beforehand. Therefore, it has changed. Okay. So if I were to, where is ARR? There we go. If I do this, then again, this will be reset. You see, I have again reset the values of ARR to 1 to 10. But right now, the values of ARR have changed because of this to 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 70, 10. There you go. Then I will reset this. Important notes on slices. How am I slicing an array? I have taken this range as I've shown before and I have assigned it to a variable and I'm showing the slice one to six. Let's say I want a bigger slice one to seven slice of array dash colon dash. Now, if there's only a colon arguments, does, does anyone have any idea what this means? There's only a colon as an argument over here. It includes everything in the array. Yes, so all, all parts of the array, everything in the array will become 99. So what you're saying? Yes, there we go. But one thing is, if this slice is changing, the original array will also change. So I've changed all values from 0 to 7 to 99. That is fine. Now you have seen an array of 7, values that are 99, but the original value also becomes 99. Okay. It is just a view of the original array because this avoids memory problems. It was previously discussed that Python is extremely good at handling its memory. You don't have to handle anything. Like in C, you need to use pointers and stuff. In Java, you need to allocate memory and stuff. No, you have to do nothing in Python. Python will handle everything on its own. Jai Mata Di. Okay. So again, this is this. To get a copy, need to be explicit. ARR underscore copy equals ARR dot copy. Now what you've done is you've created a copy of this using the dot copy function. Very simple. It's literally dot copy. You can't forget that. Okay. No matter what array you create, you will get a copy of this. Let's say I reset this. Uh, one second. I reset the array. It has become another array of 1 to 10 range. I go down here and I do this. You see ARR underscore copy is its own variable. It's its own array. Just 1 to 10. There we go. Indexing a 2D array using matrices. Row, comma, column. Whenever you address a matrix, you will use row, comma, column format. Left value will be row, right value will be column. Over here you can see ARR underscore 2D of 1. This will give you the first index ka row. Why is it not giving me this? Anyone, any idea? That's index 0. Index Perfect. Is zero. Zero. Sorry, one second. Boom, boom. Do you see zeroth is the uh, is the first one. First is the second one, and second is the third one. If I do three, obviously it will be out of bounds. So let us do one. Boom. You can use comma or you can use square brackets in order to differentiate between the number of rows and the number of columns. Very simple, okay? You want to get an individual element value. In the first row, the zeroth column. First row is this, zeroth column will be this. Okay, that is 20. If I do two comma one, any idea what this will give me? Forty. Correct. You are correct. It will give me forty. 
getting individual element value again, same thing. So if I do, let's say, 0, 2. Any idea what this will give me? Yes, you are correct again. 2D array slicing. You can slice an array or a matrix from left to right. So you see colon two, one colon. What does this mean? 10, 15, 25, 30 has been sliced. What does colon mean? Everything before two, correct? So the first two rows have been sliced. And then one colon means everything after the first column has been sliced. So you will be left with this 10, 15, 25, 30. Very easy to understand. Well, how do we bottom... define Sorry? that? Uh, how do we know that we need to take out a row or column? What is the particular command? Uh, if you want to take out a particular row or column, you just do this. If you want the first row, you do this. Or if you want this, you can do. Oops, one second. Uh, two, this gives you the second row. One, this gives you the first row. Here, this gives you the zeroth row. All right. That is how you get the particular row. Hello? Yes, I, I got it. Yeah, you got it. That is how you do that. And then 2D array slicing, this is done. Shape bottom row, you're just basically showing the bottom row. If you want to edit it, you can do two comma colon, which is every element in the last row. I do, oops, I do not like this. One, that's every element in the middle row, zero, every element in the first row. And then this is uh, just a fancy way of printing whatever row you want, okay? Now, this is John. Fancy indexing. Fancy indexing allows you to select entire rows or columns out of order. Now to show this, whatever order you have given here, it will display it in any particular way that you mention it. You create a zeros array of 10 times 10. And let's say you want to display ARR today. This is a 10 times 10 matrix filled with zeros. Okay. Now you want to see the length of ARR. ARR underscore length is equal to ARR 2D dot shape of one. You want to display this. You see the length of this will be 10. If I just do this, this will be a 10 times 10 matrix, but you just want the length of it. So I do one. Oops. One. And you have one. Now you set up an array for i in range arr underscore length arr 2d of i equals i, which means every row over here that you have, you're changing the value of this for, from a for loop to what numbered row this is. So this, is, this has the index zero, so it'll be filled with zeros. This row. Since it is the first row, it will be filled with ones. This will be filled with second twos. Sorry, not seconds, twos. This will be filled with threes. This will be filled with fours, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. Okay. And this will be the resultant array. Is this clear? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, this will be the resistant uh, re resultant array. Now you can display whatever rows you want in this, however you want. If I want the first row, the fifth row, the second row. Oops, I need to run this as well, and then this, there we go. Only one, five, and two has been printed. If I want, say, one, five, six, one, eight, five, six. Oops, there's another comma, there we go. One eight five six. 
you can print it however you want. It is over here as well. Um, let's increase the dimensions by 11, 11. And run the same code again. Now you see it is a bigger array and it has the value 10 in it as well. Again, you run this code. You see there's another column that has been added over here as well. You see there'll be another column which will be added. Boom. Another column has been added. It's because I changed the size of this matrix. I hope this is clear to everyone. OK, at least we'll be done soon. Just a little bit more. Selection. We can use brackets for selection based off of comparison operators. You create an array of range 0 to 10. No, sorry, 1 to 10. And now what I'm doing is I'm seeing which of these values are greater than 4. Is 1 greater than 4? No, false. Is 2 greater than 4? False. 3 greater than 4 is false. If 4 greater than false, it is equal to 4, it is not greater than. Or ARR equal to 4. Oops. I need to. Cannot assign to expression. Oh, I suppose we need to put it in an if. So yes, um, you see that this will be false because four is not equal to four, it, and it's asking for values greater than four. Everything after four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten will be true. If I want to see which, if it is equal to or greater than four. I need to put it in an if condition, but I really don't want to because I have another file to look at after this. OK. Boolean equals you're basically assigning whatever this is. To a variable. And you're printing the variable. Very simple. I hope this is understood by everyone. Waiting for a response, guys. Yes, uh, okay. yes. Thank you. Now, array of bool ARR, what you're doing is you want to see what are these values? You know that they're not bigger than four, but what are these values? Which, what are they? What are the true values over here? So you just do ARR of bool ARR. This will index, sorry. This will index all the values which are true and then it will print them. ARR of ARR greater than two will obviously print everything that's greater than two. ARR of ARR equal to 10. Equal to equal to 10. We'll just print 10. Equal to equal to nine. Just print nine. Um, ARR less than five. We'll print one, two, three, four. This is understood. X equals two. ARR greater than X. This is the same thing as this. We're just assigning variable instead. Great job. Let's move on to NumPy operations. You can easily perform array with array arithmetic or scalar with array arithmetic. Let's see some examples. Import NumPy as NP, ARR equals, again, same thing. I added, one second, let's view ARR over here first. Oh. Now I added the values of ARR with the values of ARR. And this is what I got. 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Then I multiplied them to each other and then I got the squares. Okay. If I want the squares of the first 10 numbers, this is how I would do it. Very simply. I subtract them with each other and I get a bunch of zeros. Um, on division by zero, you will get a warning, but not an error because the rest of the code works, correct? And this is not a compile, but an interpreted. So every line, every step is checked whenever you see this, okay? You can't divide zero with zero because that will give you an error in computers. See this? Invalid value encountered and divide, ARR by ARR. But everything else is correct. And zero by zero will be displayed as any n. Now one by ARR, one by zero, we know we cannot define it. So it'll just display it as infinity, okay? And the others will uh, display whatever the value of one divided by that, that number is. One by one is one, one by two is 0 0.5, one by three is 0 0.333, one by four is 0 0.25, and so on. ARR cubed. Star star is the power of operator. Everyone knows this. ARR cubed will give you the cubes of all of the numbers. 
and this you can see how it works. Universal array functions. NumPy comes with many universal array functions, which are essentially just mathematical operations you can use to perform the operation across the array. Let's show some common ones, taking square roots. NumPy has these default array functions, which means you can just simply find them using these default functions. So square root is obviously square root. Square root of zero is zero, square root of one is one, two is 1.4, three is 1.732, four is two, so on and so forth. It does not matter how big your array is. This is because I added 10 over here. That's why you have an extra value that has come up. Exponential is e raised to the power of something. So e raised to the power of zero is one. e raised to the power of one is 2.718282, to whatever. e raised to the power two is 7.3, and so on and so forth. You have all of these numbers. Also, may take note: plus zero zero plus zero zero plus zero one plus zero two plus zero three. These are all raised to the power of. Okay. So 10 to the power of 2, 10 to the power of 1, and so on and so forth. I hope you all understand this. NP.max of ARR is the same as ARR.max. You're just finding the maximum value in this array. And you know that the maximum value is, well, I have changed it, so it will be 10 now. Sine, cos, tan are still the same. If I create a new one over here, NP dot cos of ARR, boom, at the cos. And I think there's a tan as well. I might be wrong. Tan of ARR. Nope. There has there is a tan function as well. So yeah, you can find the sign of your data set. You can find the cos of your data set, your the tan of your data set. This will come into handy when you're analyzing large amounts of data and you need to convert them if it is some sort of mathematical data that is. Okay. Log is again logarithmic value. You see, log zero will give you minus infinity. So you're still you're just dividing by zero, correct? You can't find it. Log one will be zero, log two will be 0 0.69. This, these are all valid values. And that is all we need to know for now from NumPy.